so we're going to do work, quick feedback from all the workshops and then we're going to go to break at three o'clock. So anyone who's doing workshop feedback should scamper this way. Okay, we'll just wait for everybody to join us. I don't think we've got quite enough chairs, but um, we can hover at the back if that's all right. Um, okay, well, we'll go through the workshop feedback in order um, as they were presented in the little intro yesterday. Um, so everybody's just going to talk briefly for uh, about five minutes about what they went through, their sort of process, their discoveries, surprises, outcomes, next steps. Um, so uh, rather than listening to me, I shall hand you over to Leslie Thompson to talk about open science responsibilities. Okay. Right. So. I have to say, I was quite nervous about running this workshop. I had, brilliant. I had a fantastic group that joined this workshop. Um, they did exactly what they were asked for. They suspended their disbelief and they carried on through a facilitated process for which I was ever so grateful. Um, it's not possible in the short time I've got to explain everything we did in the workshop, so I've just got one slide to try and summarize what we said. Ah, okay. So we had three phases to our workshop. The first phase, we looked at open science, and would it be more open, more collaborative, or more transparent? We discussed that. And we either agreed or disagreed with certain aspects. Interestingly, the balance between commercial and societal publishers the importance of fair, sensitivity and collaboration sat in neither agree or disagree. And in every category, money and who pays come, came up. Um, we then took that discussion of open science and what its attributes might be and fed it through to think about the impact that open science would have on the workflow of different personas, the researcher, the librarian, the publisher and funder. It was a very rich output from that group. But one thing that struck me was our great and really energetic group identified 17 bullet points for researchers to consider, eight for librarians, 12 for publishers, and 10 for funders. Um, and the people that we're all here to serve are the researchers. So we'll go through and look at that in more detail when we go through writing up the workshop. In phase three, we asked people to look at the actions that were identified for each persona and think about how more effectively we could move towards an open research cycle by pooling what different personas needed to do. Um, and the one thing that stood out for me was the realization that to move towards a more open research ecosystem, we were going to have to look for more mechanisms to collaborate and to discuss and think collectively outside our silos how we were going to move to a more open research world. And um, one comment that came up at the end, which I thought was really important, and that was that we must make sure in this drive towards open um, ecosystem that we empower researchers and we put them at the core of what we do. So, that's been an incredibly quick summary of a very rich and a very deep conversation that we had. But the group worked incredibly collaboratively, and I think we uncovered some things that we will all think about. We'll write this up as a report, I'm more than happy to let anyone see it. But I just want to say thank you. I hope I've done justice in the short time I've had to your great discussions, but you were a fantastic group to facilitate and I might even come back and do it again, and that's frightened them all. Thank you. That's great. Thank you, uh, Leslie, and thank you for sticking to time. Um, okay, so the next workshop was uh, Resilience Through Diversity, and Nancy Roberts from Business Inclusivity is going to give the feedback on that one. Brief pause while my slides hopefully appear. Okay, I'm, I'm going to rattle through the first lot of my slides quite quickly because there's an awful lot of detail in here. 
Um, the first thing I want to say is, again, um, to echo what Leslie said, a huge thank you to the people who joined my group. And I think a particular thank you because talking about diversity is, is quite difficult. Um, we asked people in the group to take a certain degree of personal risk and talk about their own experiences. Um, and it's not an easy topic to tackle, and I think it takes a bit of bravery. So I was really grateful to the people who joined in that conversation really productively and really positively. So thank you to all of you for, for being part of that experience. Um, we did a bit of journey mapping. We started off looking at um, different personas. Personas is obviously the theme of the workshops this year. Um, and we were trying to understand uh, how we might reach a more diverse talent pool. So we were looking at the interactions that we have with people, um, where we might be missing reaching out to people, and how we might look at opportunities to fix some of that. We talked a bit about recruitment strategies, and we talked about how can we tackle bias and how can we create a more inclusive workplace. So there was a lot of discussion around all of these points, and I'm just running through it very quickly in the interest of time. But again, I will share all of this material with anyone who's interested. Um, we came up, I think, with the beginnings of a sort of best practice. Again, I'm not going to read through all of this because there's a lot in there, but the beginnings of a best practice about how you might go about tackling bias and addressing diversity in your organization. So, we didn't get everywhere. There are things that we felt we would have needed a bit more time and we wanted to do a bit more work on, particularly around selection bias, because um, it's quite a big topic and we only really skimmed it. But in the other areas, we did come up with, um, with some recommendations. Some were fairly commonsensical, some were a bit more radical, such as social events that don't involve alcohol. Apparently, that's a thing that you can do. Um, so we looked really at, at what we can do. We tried to identify groups and forums that were useful for us to engage with. Um, and also looking at the way that we present ourselves as an industry. So what we end up with, and this is where uh, we put the work back to all of you, is, is a call to action really. I think we felt in the room that the topic was very big and at times it felt overwhelming. But we also felt that individually we can all take some small steps that will make a big difference and when I look around this room and think if everyone in here was able to take one small step towards changing their recruitment process or their selection process to be more inclusive we'd start to see a real sea change so I'd really encourage you all to think about that. We also want to put together a kind of manifesto for change that's come out of this so thinking about the the sort of goals and objectives of, of being a more diverse industry why do we want to do that why does it matter um, and thinking a little bit about what we can do to make that happen. We'd also ask you all to share some of the outputs that we've had. So again, I will send this material around. And I've got my contact details on the slide as well. Um, and we'd ask you all to just read it, think about who in your organization you could share it with, think about whether there are things you can do in your own work um, that would be useful. I'm asking you to join me if you're interested, join all of us. Um, we'd like to take this a bit further. We think there's, there's real opportunity to do something really interesting here. So if you're interested in joining and helping to shape that manifesto and helping us to work on these issues, then please do. I would also ask you to um, give us a benefit of your network. We talked a little bit about how we might take this forward to the Publishing Association, who have a diversity initiative going on this year, which many of you may be aware of. We also talked about whether there were other industry bodies that we could engage with. So if you sit on a board or a part of an industry body who might be interested in talking to us about this, then please do get in touch. I think in this room we're probably, it's probably a pretty big network out there, so I'd love to hear from people who might be able to put me in touch with someone that would be interested. In terms of next steps, um, we thought we might work it up into a scholarly kitchen article just to talk about the kind of issues that were raised and also to surface some of the issues that we didn't have enough time to talk about. I've talked about creating a manifesto. As I said before, I'd be really interested to have as much input as possible on that, so if you're interested, please do get in touch. We want to talk to other industry bodies. And we want to share these best practices as widely as possible. So we'd like everybody to take a look at these slides and think of something that they could do differently in their organization. And maybe just each of us making one small personal change, as I said earlier, could make a big difference. So again, thank you to my group for a really, really positive discussion. There was some disagreement. There was um, some lots of different views in the rooms. But I think we all felt that we came up with some concrete things that we can do, which are captured in the earlier slides. So if you're interested, these are my contact details. And I will make these slides available through some mechanism on LinkedIn or something like that so that you can all take a look in more detail at the recommendations. So thank you very much.
Thank you, Nancy. Um, okay, and workshop C on open data sharing. We have Fiona Murphy and, oh, Robert Samos, who's going to uh, come back and give the feedback. Hi, I'm, I'm the uh, window dressing. If there are technical questions, the experts over there and, and down there. Um, so uh, I do want to thank very much uh, Fiona and Sarah Callahan, um, who uh, really put all of this together. We had a very productive uh, several sessions. We had a great group. Um, the uh, overall project, as I mentioned yesterday, is an effort by the Belmont Forum, which is two dozen national science funding agencies and a subset of the science publishing community, to try to develop a uh, template and policy around uh, data accessibility statements, uh, basically trying to harmonize the messages that we're trying to give to researchers uh, regarding um, data sharing and expectations. Um, <clears throat> we're trying to develop something that we can all agree on and that the Belmont Forum can endorse uh, in November and incorporate into its uh, calls for proposals, <clears throat> excuse me, calls for proposals beginning next year. Um, and as I stressed, we all stressed to the workshop participants, the input that they're giving us is this is not just a, a philosophical uh, intellectual exercise. This is actually going to help shape the, the language that we're using. So we had uh, in the three different uh, sessions, we sort of laid the groundwork, uh, identified the key issues. Uh, in the second session, we had very productive uh, breakout sessions that really delved into the details. And then this morning, we tried to knit it together and actually start working on developing specific language for uh, data accessibility statements in the future. Um, just as an example, um, we took a, uh, an existing uh, element of a data accessibility statement and then sort of dissected it. And one of the um, very uh, positive advantages of working with this particular group uh, the last two days is that we had a lot of input from librarians and from institutions, so it was uh, a nice complement to the conversations that have been happening with the uh, funders and the science publishers. So working off of this uh, uh, starting point, uh, I'm not going to go into all of these, but you'll see that there are any number of different kinds of issues that come up when you're trying to figure out exactly how to best approach and best frame uh, requirements that you're looking for from uh, researchers. And so we um, will be going through all of these kinds of issues as we're moving forward over the next few months. Um, we are uh, continuing to look for insights from uh, all of you in the room. Uh, the URL here, we made it tiny so you can scribble it down really fast or it can be circulated if you can read it. Um, and uh, it's an open document, so we're very uh, willing to take additional comments from others who weren't actually involved in the, in the workshop itself. Uh, we will be presenting a more fleshed out framework at RDA in Berlin next uh, month, and then uh, continuing to work forward on this through the uh, rest of the spring and summer looking towards uh, the fall. Um, so if you are interested in um, interacting with us, uh, we welcome that, and you can reach either of us at the emails below, and we're also in the list. And thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Bob. And for our workshop D, we have uh, metadata life cycles, and Ross Mounts is going to uh, give some feedback. Hi there, um, I have no slides, um, so if you want uh, to see something pretty on your screen, you can go to metadata2020.org and have a look about the project. Um, Metadata 2020 is all about uh, providing rich, open um, metadata in the scholarly life cycle. Um, in the workshop, we kind of road, road tested some of the uh, mission statements and some of the stakeholder um, engagements and challenges. Um, some publishers, you know, bravely ventured forth to um, ask us to have a look at their cross-ref uh, metadata participation for them. And we discovered that for one particular publisher, there wasn't that much metadata participation. Um, so there was kind of, we, we found out quite quickly that um, there was certainly room for improvement um, with the amount of metadata that um, publishers submit. But 
Um, this also is the same is true for um, librarians and with institutional repositories and data site DOIs. That um, you know, it's not just the data site DOI identifier, but that there's, there's actually metadata behind that. And we explored how researchers um, use that metadata, how they can query that metadata with um, our packages like our, our data sites and our crossref. Um, how they can find how many times an identifier has been cited, how they can uh, find who the authors were of a particular identifier. Um, and I think um, really one of the main conclusions of our workshop was um, that we need to raise awareness about metadata that metadata exists and we need to make it richer and um, that there's disciplinary differences um, in the types of um, researchers that are engaged with metadata and, and researchers that aren't so engaged with metadata. So for, for example, bioinformaticists might know a lot about um, <laughs> metadata and might use it in their research, but maybe less so for medieval historians. Um, and, and so, yeah, if you, if you go to the metadata2020.org website, we have um, six different projects to get involved with. Um, one which we went through um, yesterday was the metadata evaluation project, how to actually evaluate um, objectively, if at all possible, uh, metadata participation. Um, and Crossref um, are going to be launching, or perhaps have launched, um, these publisher uh, metadata participation reports. And so we showed a few of those on the screen. Um, Hindawi are an excellent um, publisher in this regard. They've got a very good report card. They have high uh, metadata uh, participation. Um, but it depends field by field. And so we went through what some of the metadata fields were. Uh, data field, the funder field, the full text field, the license of the resource. Um, and we, we went through which kind of um, users might want that field to be um, filled and why and the kind of use cases. And we got some very good feedback that um, Metadata 2020 needs to develop more personas and more kind of concrete use cases of, of why publishers and librarians sh should provide richer metadata. Um, so we've, we've taken, that, taken that in and we'll be working on some concrete um, use cases. Um, and I'll keep that short and sweet, I guess. Um, thank you. Thank you, Ross. And our final workshop was workshop E on open access communications, and Sally Ramsey from the University of Oxford is going to present. And I'm going to hold up a URL. Well, let's see. And the eagle-eyed amongst you will notice that I'm not Valerie, nor Katrina, nor um, Liz, and I'm standing in for them because they've had to uh, leave the conference early. Our workshop was around um, the simplifying open access um, communications and follows uh, the comments follow on very nicely actually from what Ross has been talking about. Um, the, well, look, we were looking at what could feasibly be achieved after identifying some pain points and then the actions that could be taken in order to address some of these uh, pain points. And the process was split into four key stages, starting with the submission process. And the priority here that we identified was to save off the time by minimizing unnecessary data in input at submission, so we're not looking at rich metadata at this point, we're actually looking at the opposite. The recommendation is that publishers should require minimal essential information at first submission and to make it clear why they need each piece of information. This is to save authors time at this point. Uh, publishers could not require the manuscript to be in the journal's precise house style at first submission as well. That's a, um, a challenge that we wondered about. And we wondered if authors may be more willing to provide more information once their paper has been accepted. Now, we didn't feel we had enough in, um, knowledge and expertise to offer solutions at that point. So we're suggesting an information gathering exercise to find out from the various actors what information should be required from authors at that point of first submission. One thing which we did think was we felt getting institutional affiliated ORCIDs for all potential um, authors at the earliest possible stage, um, that is at grant submission stage, would help convey a, a great deal of information very easily. Now the second part of the process is peer review and the priority there is to make sure that communications around peer review are relevant to the recipient reading them, so it's sort of on, you know, uh, data, rec data receiving mode. 
So the action there is to allow other trusted parties not involved with the data creation to access and transfer relevant information between portals. So one example that was given is the data that's put into the JAIRS grant submission portal and allowing that to flow through the whole workflow. Then we came to the publication process and the priority there that was identified was the problem of frustration experienced by grantees as to how funders communicate their requirements. So an interesting idea uh, was floated there about a, a badging mechanism that creates a menu of variables from which the funder can identify those relevant to their own policy, such as green, gold, embargo period, uh, deposition requirement and license type. They would display then the badge on their website, a little, I think, like the Creative Commons. You, you know, you choose your license from the, the various drop-down um, options there. Um, and then it would also have an application for journals and publishers and create a sort of easy view uh, for researchers at the authoring stage. And the group felt that it could have an additional benefit of reducing edge cases i.e., you know, simplify your policy at this stage. So the people felt responsible for that are the DOAJ, NISO, and Sherpa Romeo, and others of that ilk. Finally, we come to payment, and the priority there is the communications around payment. Um, and it was felt it would be beneficial to agree a set of metadata to be shared around all articles and transactions, so for rights link and GISC, um, the GIST might work on this. And those responsible for this might include overseers of open access, such as OASPA, ESAC, the top people, and CASRI, to, steps, to set standards for compliance. And this would be building on existing work. And in the UK, it may sit with the research bodies themselves as they move towards the UKRI integration. Or it could be an independent organization, such as NISO. Um, Within these discussions, um, it would also need an institutional and funder representative, so people could be drawn from the open access um, uh, participation group that RCUK set up, UUK, efficiencies group, and others. So the take-home points from this are that we need an international standards body for payment of APCs. We need a clear visual system for authors to understand requirements of their funders and the options with their chosen journal to ensure that appropriate and relevant information is shared throughout the whole publishing process, and to tie in ORCIDs and look for consistent information gathering to support all stakeholders, but with the goal of minimizing the workload for authors and increasing efficiency across the system. I think we probably can all buy into that. Uh, various members of the workshop uh, indicated that they'd be willing to participate in the actions, and the workshop organisers um, will liaise with the interested bodies such as JISC, UUK, CASRA, UCOR, and so on. There is a Google uh, document with notes from the workshop, and um, Valerie and co have asked that um, you add your name and email to the Google Doc if you want to be kept informed. Now, you probably can't see that, so um, I think Valerie and, and Liz and Katrina will be putting that, uh, you, you, that uh, web address around. So please do participate if you would like to. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Sally. Um, thank you to all of our workshop presenters. Um, we have got uh, about 10 minutes, so if anybody's got some questions for any of our facilitators or presenters, um, I'd be happy to invite them now. Anthony? I was terribly impressed by all these people have done, I must say. I'm thinking about how we can make sure that what we're doing fits in with what is already being doing. Um, and I men mention it because, for example, the Open uh, Scholarship Initiative is having a meeting in March, and I'll be passing on stuff so that they don't start planning something that is different from this. But there are lots of other bodies. I mean, um, the last speaker, I forgot who it was, actually it was Sally, so I <laughs> mentioned some people, and I, I would strongly suggest making sure you're in touch with the standards organizations, and in, in Europe it's mainly editor, 
and so on. But these are, it's worth getting at an early stage, getting in touch with as many organizations as seem relevant, it seems to me. I mean, you've, some of you have said this, but it's a difficult problem of everybody starting doing initiatives when somebody else is doing it. And secondly, I would say, make sure it's not just European and American, please, everybody. You know, the other parts of the world. That was more of a comment than a question. <laughs> Thank you, Anthony. Does anybody else would like to ask about any of the particular workshops? I'm taking that as a, we're going for coffee early. I will hand back to Mark. If you'd like to, if I could get everybody to uh, give everyone a round of applause for all the hard work they put in. Great, thank you so much workshop leaders. A lot of work goes into preparing and managing these workshops. I think they're a really important part of our program, but it's, uh, it's hard work for all those people, so thank you all. Um, right, we're now going to go to break a little bit early, which is nice. There's a chance for you all to get outside and enjoy the sunshine, because it's a lovely day. Um, you, those of you sitting on this side of the room will have been seeing snow, but it's not real, you're just imagining it, it's fine. Um, so uh, this break is uh, sponsored by Sheridan Pub Factory, so thank you very much for that. Nice long break, back at 3.30 uh, for the inimitable conference summary, which will be brief, but then followed by our, our innovation, which is of a closing keynote speech um, by what many people would call the best librarian in the world. Um, so uh, do stay for that, it's going to be awesome. <laughs>